This video is about a tool I made a few months ago before I moved out of my old workshop. I fit a forge or chuck to my lathe by making a custom backplate. I'm making this video as part of Toolfest 2021, an event where makers from all over YouTube upload a tool making video on the same day. Go and check some out by searching for the hashtag. Welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. Back when I started making videos, I had a four-jaw chuck fitted to my lathe. It was an 80mm chuck designed for Chinese mini lathes and was a bit big for the Broxon. I'd fitted it to the lathe by making a steel backplate, which was honestly way thicker than it needed to be. Put together, the chuck and the backplate were way more weight than this lathe was intended to spin. I was getting a lot of vibration and it felt like I was putting the spindle bearings at risk. After digging through tool sellers over a couple of years, I eventually came across a low-profile 80mm chuck that looked more suitable. I put a lot of thought into how to make a backplate as thin as possible while still providing the strength required and came up with this design, and you can check out the CAD model with the link in the description. I'm going to make the backplate from a slice of this 42 CRM04 alloy steel, a similar grade to 4140. This is a large diameter of round stock for me to be working with, and the tooth count of the bandsaw blade is probably a bit fine. I should adjust the guide for the, to the right length to keep the blade a bit more stable. Extra unsupported blade length can flex and drift, reducing the accuracy of the cut. I fitted a new blade to this saw pretty recently, and ever since I've noticed a bump in the saw handle once every cycle of the blade, but it's noticeably worse with this large stock diameter. The blade has jumped off its drive wheels, so I have to remove the blade cover to reseat it. I'll take the opportunity to check out the blade. The point where the alloy steel band is welded into a loop seems to have a slight offset error, so the back of the blade has this slight step. I think it's pretty clear I can't really correct that, but I'm going to try and smooth the step a bit so it doesn't jump so violently. A small Dremel style grinding wheel has no problem smoothing the step, and I tried to make the back edge as fair as possible. A bench stone polishes the edge a little and also makes sure there are no burrs left which might snag or wear the saw wheels. Wax lubricant should cut down heat from rubbing and help keep the cut consistent without making too much mess everywhere. The saw is obviously still bumping every cycle but it doesn't feel as sharp through the handle. This is going to be a really long cut, as the diameter is huge for this saw, and the material is also pretty tough. I try to carefully apply the right amount of force to keep the cut moving, without enough resistance to slow the motor down too much. The blade jumping off is still a risk, and it happens again before too long, but I didn't bother to film refitting it again. I chose this material rather than cast iron, because I'm very concerned about keeping the weight down. The 80mm chuck is lighter than the previous one, but it's still heavy for this lathe, and I want to avoid adding any more weight than I don't have to. 42 CRM04 is very strong, much stronger than cast iron, and should allow me to keep the plate quite a bit thinner than it would be in cast iron. To turn this slice into a back plate, I need to face both sides parallel and cut a through hole in the middle. I'll then cut a pocket in one side to register on the lathe spindle, and a shoulder on the other side to register the chuck. Finally, I'll need holes for two sets of mounting screws, one set to hold the backplate to the spindle, and the other to hold the chuck to the backplate. The stock Proxon chuck is 75mm in diameter, and this 80mm round bar is the very limit of what I can safely hold with the outside jaws. I check the amount of engagement of the jaws with the scroll at that distance. The fewer teeth each jaw has engaged with the scroll, the easier it is to break the scroll or the jaw by over-tightening the chuck. The cross slide doesn't have enough travel to fully cover the 80mm diameter, and a regular right-handed tool on the left side of the tool post won't reach the edge. The solution is a left-handed tool on the back of the tool post. 
The face is very irregular and cuts will be interrupted, so I use a cheap disposable carbide insert. The torque required to overcome cutting forces at the maximum diameter is high, so passes will have to be very shallow to avoid overloading the lathe. Once I've smoothed out the roughest edges, I feel more comfortable turning the RPM up a bit. Coated carbide inserts can handle much higher cutting speeds than hand ground tools, but can more easily chip when cutting isn't smooth. Cuts start to feel smoother as the roughness is reduced, but as engagement increases there's more drag on the motor and it comes close to stalling. More torque will be needed as engagement increases, and as this is a DC motor that means more power and more RPM. The balance between RPM and power is tricky. Too much RPM will burn out the insert, too little and the lathe will stall. I can afford to run the lathe with more power than I expected though, as once the tool engages the cutting forces slow the lathe down. The lathe drive belts are getting old and they may be slipping more than they should. The cross slide doesn't have enough travel to reach the centre with the tool in this position, so I, I'll clean up the centre later. It won't matter for the surface finish as a large hole will be bored in the centre of the back plate to match the through hole in the forge or chuck. Engagement of the cutting tool with the face is more than half of the circumference, but I think there's more rubbing than there should be near the centre, and I think the tool may be above the correct height. Engagement is now most of the circumference and is only interrupted for the outer part of the diameter. Drag is getting very high and more power is required. Eventually I misjudged a pass and the drag got so high it stalled the motor. When it stalled, the tool dug into the material where it didn't have the force to break the chip away and there is now a ridge in the surface of the metal. Now I'll need to carefully clear the ridge at the left at the point the cutter dug into the material. If the tool catches in the ridge, it will easily stall again and make the ridge worse. I have to continue with a much more cautious depth of cut. Engagement is now the entire circumference, which is all that's required for this face. The goal at this point is to make the face flat so the part can turn cleanly. To clean up the centre, I'll need the tool in the more conventional position so the cross like travel can reach it. The tool needs to be set at an angle as the holder would contact the face when the tool is close to the centre of the part with a diameter this large. I could have done this by rotating the tool post slightly, 
but I've gotten into the habit of always setting the toolpost square, as it can save a lot of time aligning tools. The small circle forming at the centre of the part shows me that the tool is set too low and needs to be raised on centre. That's better, but still a bit low. It should be really clear to any experienced machinist what the problem is now, but my view wasn't nearly as good as you get through the camera lens, and I didn't notice. I became convinced the insert wasn't cutting properly because it was worn out, so I stopped to check. The insert point looked worn, so I flipped it around to use a new cutting edge. The new point cuts a bit better, but it's still not perfect. It takes me a few passes to work out that I've set the tool too high, so I need to set it back down again. Finally, that seems to be cutting right. Now is a good time to start working on the through hole. As I mentioned, the plate needs a through hole to allow parts to pass through the chuck and on down the spindle bore through the headstock. As usual, I start the hole with the lathe centre drill. The chuck has a 20mm through hole diameter, and to match that I'll need to drill then bore it out, as this lathe won't be able to cut with a twist drill nearly that large. The pilot drill is a regular 5mm high speed steel twist drill. The chuck through hole is quite a bit larger than the spindle bore, but the mounting pole pattern is wide enough to allow for the back plate to match the chuck, which will be useful for getting the most flexibility out of the setup. The second drill pass is a very short 10mm solid carbide twist drill. Solid carbide can cut at higher speeds than high speed steel, but it needs to be used with, with caution as it's very easy to break the cutting edge by shocking it. I'm not going to bore the centre hole at this stage, because the opposite face still hasn't been cleaned up, which means it's not yet perfectly symmetrical and won't run that smoothly yet. Most of the part is still very rough, which means the weight distribution won't be perfectly symmetrical. Off-centre weight causes vibrations which make it impossible to get a good surface finish or a decent precision on a small light lathe, so the priority is to clean up most of the geometry before I start on the precise machining. The second face is much closer to true already. When I cut the first face, this face was pressed firmly against the flat surfaces of the jaws, so I just have to clean up the unevenness from the saw blade. It takes a few passes, but this time I have the advantage of already knowing what speed and depth of cut to use to avoid stalling the lathe. Once the face is completely cleaned up, I check the thickness of the disc at various points to make sure it's reasonably consistent. Inconsistent thickness would mean that I'd made a mistake in the setup at some point, or my lathe is cutting way out of true. It would mean that the weight of the part was off centre, which would cause the spindle to wobble when the back plate was fitted to it. Spindle wobbles mean inaccurate parts and bad finishes. The part should now be symmetric enough and run smoothly enough that I can bore out the through hole. To do this I need to move the tool post back to its normal position so I can mount a boring bar on the front face. 
As I only have a 10mm hole to start with, I need to use a pretty thin boring bar. To make up for the lack of rigidity, I've set it as short as possible. The shorter the length, the less it flexes and the more material it should be able to remove. Our scraping noise is a problem. The corner of the compound side is rubbing against the face of the part and the boring bar can't reach through the hole. This is a problem that would never happen when machining parts with a more normal part diameter for this lathe, but for this job I'll need to set the boring bar longer than I'd like to make sure there's clearance. Once the hole is big enough, I switch over to a much larger boring bar which should be much more rigid and allow me to take more material per pass. It should also give me a much better finish which will be important for the last pass. Lining up calipers with the edge of the bore lets me see how close the size is getting without having to move the carriage far away to make room for a measuring tool to reach into the bore. Once I'm close to the chuck bore size, I check with a cheap my inside mic. It's not an especially accurate instrument, but it's much easier to use on inside diameters than the digital calipers. The bigger boring bar makes it easy to get a nice finish on the last pass. Now I need to bore a 40mm diameter pocket to act as a register for the lathe spindle. This boring bar is the perfect tool for the job, so I'll keep using it. I use the calipers to measure and place a mark about the right distance from the centre hole. I then use the tool to make a witness mark at a slightly smaller diameter, allowing for the fairly sloppy measurement. I can then check the diameter to make sure I don't overshoot 40mm. I'll machine the pocket a millimeter or so undersized, then carefully bring it out to final dimension once it's been cut to the right depth. This pocket is the register for the backplate, which means its inner diameter is in contact with the outer diameter of the lathe spindle. To make sure the chuck runs true, this fit must be close to ensure the backplate is fitted to the same position every time. It mustn't be a press or interference fit though, as that would cause wear to the spindle each time the chuck is fitted or removed, and wear on the spindle register would cause increased runouts on all chucks. The pocket has to be fairly deep as the spindle has a fairly large chamfer on its front edge, so the depth must be a decent amount larger than this chamfer. 
The pocket is now the right depth, so now I need to bring the diameter out to the right measurement by boring along the axis. I machined it smaller than the required diameter to start with, because it's much more difficult to machine a pocket like this to the correct diameter and depth in the same sequence of operations, and it's very hard to get a good finish on the back face and the inner diameter face at the same time. As I cut the outer diameter, I'm also pushing the tool into the back face a little to create a relief in the back face near to the outer diameter. Once the diameter is correct, the final fit check is with the Proxon dividing head, which has the same geometry as the lace spindle, so it should be good to verify the correct fit. These inner corners are pretty sharp, so I'm taking the corners off with the deburring tool to make it safe. Now that the pocket is the right size, I'm going to try and clean the outer face of this side of the part. The face had a lot of fine tear marks, which are often caused by running carbon insert tooling with speeds and feeds other than what they're spec for. Inserts are generally spec for commercial CNC machines, which can do feeds and speeds that a small hobby lathe can't dream of. This finish pass creates long stringy chips because it's too shallow for the chip breaker built into this insert. It's one of the downsides of using insert tooling on a small light lathe, and it makes me want to learn to use other types of tooling to see if I can get better finishes more easily. I speed up the RPM as the tool gets closer to the inner edge to try and keep the surface cutting speed similar and reduce the chance of tearing, ruining the finish. Finally, I used a rubberized silicon carbide abrasive stick to improve the finish. It's a really easy way to improve the look of turned steel, but the better the original finish, the better it works. It won't save you if your finish is bad to start with. It leaves behind an abrasive residue which is best wiped away, and should be kept off the ways of the lathe at all costs. For the rest of the lathe work, I want to mount the back plate directly onto the spindle, so the chuck has to come off, but not just to make room. I'm going to use the chuck as part of a simple easy setup to drill the round hole pattern I need to secure the back plate to the spindle. This Proxon dividing head has exactly the same fitting as the lathe spindle mount, so it'll take the chuck and allow me to very easily index a round four hole pattern. Once I've fitted the chuck, it can hold the part and will be very close to concentric with the axis of rotation of the dividing head. Unfortunately, I couldn't leave the part in the chuck while I moved it to the milling machine, as I had to get access to the chuck mounting screws. Otherwise, I could have eliminated the rechucking error, and it would have been almost perfectly concentric. To start with, I need to align the axis of rotation with the drill spindle. I can do this alignment very simply with this trick I've shown before, using the, sh the shank of a broken carbide end mill in the drill chuck. With the dividing head loose on the table, I tighten the lathe chuck drawers around the same shank, which pulls the chuck and the dividing head into axial alignment with the drill chuck. With the two trucks aligned, I can now fix the dividing head down to the cross table and it stays aligned. I now remove the carbide shank and can set up the next set of operations knowing the spindle is aligned with the centre of the lathe chuck and I can reference all positions from this point. I put the back plate in the chuck so I can drill a circle of four holes at 90 degrees for screws that will secure it to the spindle. 
By keeping the alignment locked on the x-axis, I can now accurately locate the edge of the register pocket on the y-axis with an edge finder. This saves me from a lot of time with the edge finder, repeatedly searching for the x and y edges of the pocket, gradually approaching the center of the pocket over many measurements. The edge finder is 6mm in diameter, and it kicks out when its center is exactly the radius distance from the edge it's being used to find. I need the mounting holes to be 3mm from the edge of the pocket, which is equal to the radius, so the table is now in the right position without the need for any further adjustment. To make sure the drilling starts true, I'm going to mark the hole positions with a starter drill. Just to make sure I've worked it out correctly, it's worth checking the distance from the edge to the drill tip looks right with calipers. I peck with the starter drill to avoid any significant pressure to try and ensure the accuracy of the holes. This is a short drill specially ground to establish the beginning of a hole in a flat, unmarked metal surface. It's not designed to remove a lot of material or evacuate chips like a twist drill, but a twist drill typically won't start a hole in an inaccurate location. The through holes are drilled with a very ordinary high-speed steel twist drill. Between each drilling operation, I rotate the dividing head the correct number of steps, then lock the head in position. The force through the drill should be mostly straight down, but it's best to make sure the part is secure so it can't rotate. Looks like I used too much force there, just as the cutting edges were breaking through. Twist drills can easily grab as this happens, and the curve of the flutes tries to force its way through, so it's important to be cautious close to the end of through holes. I'm going to use countersunk screws to fasten the backplate, so I need to turn the part over and cut a countersink on the other side. I can realign the part rotationally by putting the same twist drill back in the spindle and using it to align the hole with the spindle before tightening the lathe chuck. This isn't a very good countersink drill, but it's one of fairly few that drill a countersink large enough for this size of screw and still fit into the small chuck I can fit into this tiny milling machine. I chose countersink screws because they allow me to keep the screws below the face of the part without having to remove too much material. I'm hoping this means I can get the strength I need with the smallest possible backplate thickness and keep the weight as low as possible. I need to remember to bolt my milling machine down even before simple drilling jobs. <laughs> 
countersink needs to be just deep enough to make totally sure that screws don't sit proud of the surface. The back plate can now go back to the lathe, but this time without the chuck. I'm fitting the register directly to the spindle and fixing it in place with the M4 countersunk screws as planned. To make sure the back plate can be repeatedly installed the same way round, I put a mark on the inner diameter aligned with a screw hole in the spindle directly between two holes. The last face of the part can now be cleaned up, the outer edge. On a larger lathe I would take a heavy first cut and try and cut straight through the hard black scale to avoid wear on the tool. On this small light lathe that just isn't possible, so the scale has to be scraped away in several passes. Cleaning up the edge should remove the last source of asymmetry and ensure the back plate rotates with the lowest possible wobble or vibration. I need to remove as little material as possible as the diameter of the rough round bar was 80mm and the chuck to be fitted is also 80mm. I can afford to lose a small amount around the edge, but to work correctly the back plate should be around the same diameter as the chuck, so waste should be kept to a minimum. Almost there, but just a bit more to remove to get rid of this pitting. The pitting is gone, but I'm hoping I can do better than that for the finish. The final pass is very shallow, and I keep the feet as steady as possible. Finally, I make sure to move the tool away from the surface before running it back. After the finishing pass I use a file to take the sharpness off the corners. This is mostly for safety as there's more to do yet. The final turn feature is the register for the back of the chuck. As the lathe tool doesn't need to be as long for this, I'm pulling it back to the shortest length possible for the best rigidity. The chuck has a fairly large pocket covering most of the back, with a thin metal wall around the edge to form the register. To locate this register reliably, I need to take a few millimetres off the back plate diameter and only need to go a few millimetres deep. This is another jam caused by trying to take too much depth of cut. As before, I'm stopping short of the final diameter while I establish the right depth. The easiest tool to use to measure the depth is this depth micrometer. It's much more precise than necessary, but genuinely easy for this measurement than, than the calipers. The depth of this register has to be slightly smaller than the depth of the pocket in the chuck, as I want to make sure it only makes contact on the outer rim. Contact closer to the outer diameter has a stronger effect on the stability of the chuck than closer to the center, so as much of the holding force should be near the edge as possible. I have to use calipers for the register diameter because I don't have a micrometer this size. The register diameter has to be as accurate as possible though, as any inaccuracy will mean the chuck is loose and not kept on centre, or it just won't fit at all. <laughs> 
creeping up on the precise diameter with insert tooling is tricky and should be avoided if possible. After advancing the carriage, I run the tool back and forward a few times, as that seems to help me get a consistent depth. I'd probably be better off using a really sharp hand-ground tool for getting to final dimension. Once the diameter measures correct, I try the chuck on. It fits, but it's tricky to align. I can make this easier by adding a very small lead into the register. This band with a smaller diameter fits easily into the chuck and allows the chuck to be brought into alignment before slipping onto the snugger fit of the main part of the register. All the exposed corners are now finished, so it's important to knock the sharpness off them with a file. The final feature is a four hole pattern to fix the chuck to the back plate, so it's back to the milling machine. This time no chuck is required and I can mount the back plate straight onto the dividing head. The X axis of the table is still locked with the dividing head axis of rotation aligned with the drill spindle, so I just need to locate the hole pattern diameter on the Y axis. I know the distance of the hole pattern from the outer diameter of the 80mm chuck body, so I find the outer diameter of the back plate with an edge finder. I replace the edge finder with a starter drill, then move the table across 3mm, half the diameter of the edge finder. The drill axis should now align with the edge of the part. I then bring the table another 8 turns, which is 12mm, then another 0.85mm to the correct distance. This allows for the fact that the diameter of the back plate is a little under 80mm, due to the material removed cleaning up the black scale on the stock. The angle of the hole pattern from the first hole circle is about halfway between the existing holes, but I made no effort to make it exact as it just doesn't matter. Before I go any further, a quick check to make sure the detent made by the starter drill is the expected distance from the edge. It's easy to lose count of the number of steps the dividing head has turned, but fortunately I can go back and realign with the first hole. When I use a starter drill on unmarked steel with this light milling machine, it's important not to apply too much pressure, as any flexing in the column will cause the marked position to be inaccurate. It may also cause the drill tip to skid around before it's properly established a hole start on the tough surface. I didn't bother to lock the dividing head between holes though, as the force is low enough that there's no risk of the dividing head shifting. 
A quick check with the chuck to verify that the marked points align with the screw holes. Once the holes are marked, there's a challenge. The column and quill travel are not perfectly parallel to each other and neither are very square to the bed. When I raise the column to fit the longer tap drill, the point of the drill will no longer be perfectly aligned with the hole. You can see the misalignment by the way the drill shifts when the point is pushed into the detent. To correct for this, I move the table ever so slowly back until it's clear the drill is aligned. This doesn't need to be accurate to hundredths of a millimetre, as there is a fair amount of slop in the chuck mounting holes. I'm really looking forward to getting a mill that doesn't have these problems. Thinking back while I'm editing this footage, I think I should have used a pilot drill first. It's easy enough to drill straight into the material with an M8 tap drill, but it probably caused the twist drill to cut a little oversize, which is less of a risk if there's a pilot hole. This time I did lock the table to drill the holes. There's a lot more force involved and the dividing head shifting would be disastrous. I added cutting oil frequently for every hole as it seems to help the twist drill cut more cleanly but I removed some of the repetition in the editing or this would take forever. Reaching close to the end was fairly nerve wracking with this setup. When a twist drill breaks through, the flutes can easily catch on the broken edges and pull the twist drill hard down. This will usually cause this drill to stall and slip the drive belts, but it can also easily shove the drill further than expected. The body of the dividing head is just a few millimeters below the plate and made of aluminium, so would damage very easily. I think the twist drill is starting to get a bit dull, as it's clearly struggling more than with the first hole. These holes now need to be tapped for the standard M8 thread to accept the chuck fixing screws. Tapping M8 and tough steel can be fairly difficult on light equipment, so I'm starting with the first pass tap, which cuts the thread a little more shallow. This first pass is critical for making sure the thread is straight, so I use my shop-made tapping guide in the drill chuck to keep it straight. I made the tap follower back in the first year I had this YouTube channel, so you can go back and see how it was put together in the video at the top right now. A short back twist every half turn or so helps break the chips and make them easier to clear. The tap cut shallow and the chips easily clear out of the bottom of the hole, so the first pass didn't cause any problems. All four holes were exactly the same, so I'm not going to include video of the other two, 
For the second pass I use a full depth bottoming tap to bring the thread out to the right size. As long as it follows the first pass it should be straight and it's a lot easier without the tapping follower. To get rid of the burrows around the tapped holes I use a countersink bit again to add a slight chamfer. Then a run round with the deburring tool to get rid of the burr left by the countersink. I run the tap through one last time to fix the damage to the thread at the top. The backplate is now done so it's time to try it out on the lathe. Countersunk head screws are a little more fiddly to fit than cap head screws but should be worth it as they've allowed me to make the plate quite a bit thinner. The plate seems to turn pretty true so just a quick blast of compressed air to clear any fine swarf before I fit the chuck. It's almost snug enough to stay in place by itself which I think is about the right fit. The M8 mounting screws go cleanly into the threaded holes in the base plate so it looks like I got the measurement right. The downside of using a third party chuck on this kind of spindle is having to deal with two sets of screws every time the chuck is added or removed. I rejected the idea of buying the Proxon branded forgeor chuck as it seemed expensive, but given the amount of extra work and materials I've now invested in installing third party chucks, the simplicity of the Proxon chuck with just one single set of four screws seems very appealing. It's not a good idea to run a chuck with jaws loose in case they work themselves free completely, but this was just for a few seconds. This forejaw is going to be a valuable addition to my lathe tooling, and is massively more usable than the over heavy forejaw I tried to fit a few years ago. I've had a few good project ideas that have been blocked without this chuck, so expect some interesting project videos coming up. The next video will be back to working with the Unimat SL as I'm still between workshops, trying to get by in a tiny garden shed. Thanks for watching, take care, I love you all.